right? Spirit represents what is not physical, right? But the only way to be spiritual is to be deeply enmeshed in the way that most of us are in, in the physical. Welcome to the Spiritually Hungry Podcast. To be on a spiritual path means having a strong connection with spiritual forces present in our world, namely the Creator, God, Allah, the universe, whichever name you prefer your higher power to be. You know what I find interesting lately? I'm finding people, um, speakers who never really would use the word God more and more now say, I call it God, but you can call it whatever you want. Before, remember there was a time where everybody was uncomfortable with saying God. It was more like the universe. Anywho, one of the ways that we forge that connection is through prayer. And I know this podcast isn't really about prayer, but I wanted to touch upon prayer. Oh, wow. For a second, I was worried. I completely misprepared. <laughs> <laughs> I want to touch upon prayer because we I haven't think done a podcast. In we haven't. So sure. I, that's why I'm kind of bringing it in here. But I also think it leads nicely into what we are going to talk about. So what is prayer? And and more importantly, perhaps, when do we really use prayer? We pray when we're desperate. I mean, again, you don't, but this is supposed to the general population. We pray on behalf of other people for their health, safety, aid. This is called intercessory prayer. Did you know that? We pray when we're grateful. Some pray for forgiveness. We pray when we're grief stricken. We pray for guidance. Some pray spontaneously and others like Michael Berg pray at the same time every day multiple times. There are myriad ways and reasons why we pray and even different conceptions of God to pray to. So simply prayer is our connection to the Creator. But because we're human, we've made up a lot of rules around prayer. Some believe that to be devout, one must pray a prescribed number of times each day at a specific time of the day, or using specific pay- prayers. Some must do some form of washing before they pray. Others pray in a quiet and private place. Some believe you must pray by bowing your head and closing your eyes, And sometimes there's a dress code such as a covering of the head or body in certain ways. And I'm not suggesting that anything's wrong with any of these ways or these guidelines. Um, I pray every morning from a prayer book, but I think that sometimes we limit what we pay attention to because we've set up certain rules and parameters around how to connect and what the right way to do that is. It beckons the question, is there a wrong way to pray? And I want to tell you this cute story I thought it was from my friend in her childhood. And she was remembering that when she was five years old, she was sitting in church next to her grandmother, who was a devout Christian. And it was a gorgeous spring day. The doors of the chapel were open to let the breeze inside. Light from multiple stained glass windows were casting colors and shapes like a kaleidoscope against the walls and churchgoers alike. So during the prayer, she was looking up and she was taking it all in. Her eyes were open. She was feeling peaceful. She felt love, and she felt actually very connected to God in that moment. Her grandmother looks over at her, and she sees her and gives her a nudge with her elbow and some side eye to get her to close her eyes and bow her head because that was the correct way to pray, and that was it. She lost the feeling of connection, and not just that day. She lost it for years because at that age, she took from that interaction that her way of connecting with God was wrong, and was less important than following the rules of worshiping that everybody else did. And I wonder for how many people, I mean, I read a podcast last week about spiritual parenting, right? I wonder what kind of conversations around connecting to God and prayer really happen, or is it that we just expect our children to follow in the way that we do it, but maybe that's not how they connect. And maybe we do it in the way we do it because that's how we saw our parents do it. Her grandmother was a kind lady, of course, and she meant no harm, but it's ironic that she was praying wrong in her eyes, um, by having her eyes open. So my assertion is that the only way to pray incorrectly is to do it mindlessly and rigidly. Um, So we both read this op-ed piece in the New York Times with Tish Harrison Warren. It's called How to Pray With Your Eyes Open. And to all our listeners, I really recommend reading it in its totality. But in that piece, Warren poses the idea that instead of closing our eyes to focus on things above, on so-called spiritual things, Prayer is an act of noticing, of reveling, of cultivating the attention that leads to devotion. So I have more thoughts on this. It's interesting. You actually have a very specific way of praying the same way every day, but you also are very much eyes wide open. Like I can't, I haven't actually shared this with you, but you inspire me often to take pause in things because 
I'm always like, okay, yes, I'm going to enjoy that. But first I have to do this. Right. And you often are just so inspired by what you see, you know, like if you're on a golf course or you see, um, you were on a friend's boat recently and you kept sending pictures. And I thought it was funny because you really wanted to share it with your whole family. Was that oversharing? No, no, you were, (laughs) but no, you weren't. You sent it to our family, uh, group text chat. But what I loved about receiving this wasn't that I, I, of course, I wasn't experiencing it as you were. You were out there outside in the night. And, in but I, storm, which but I knew beautiful. that you were so connected and inspired. Um, and often, you know, like you have a, a cup of tea in the morning, you're looking out the window, you're just like, oh, it's just so you're able to, to connect eyes wide open very often, but also you also deeply, and maybe, I mean, I'm rambling now, but maybe you're able to do that because you I connect in that other true. way. I think it's definitely true. I think as I was thinking about this idea, right, it's almost a paradox and maybe a, a lesson we're trying to impart to our listeners where spirituality, religion, whatever words one chooses to give to their practice of life, I think a mistake, a big mistake people make is that there is this thought that a spiritual life is one that is in some way separate of the physical world. Uh, there's, a, there's a very like it can enhance, but it's something that you do for a small part of the day, and then you're hoping the rest of your day, week, life is going to be right. I mean, I think people pray because they're hoping it's going to bring positive effects, sure, sure, or outcomes, right? But I'm saying, writ large, when people uh, think often think about a spiritual life. It's the monk going to the top of a mountain mm-hmm. to be by himself, or sort of this separation from the physical, where the beautiful paradox is, right? Spirit represents what is not physical, right? But the only way to be spiritual is to be deeply enmeshed in a way that most of us aren't in the physical, right? So, well, that's why God created all of this physicality. I mean, why, favorite, yeah. why do we have this world? with all of its details and beauties and other things too, if we're not supposed to actively participate in that and, and Absolutely. connect. And I think there's a double mistake that people, all of us make to some degree. One is that a spiritual life or my spiritual life is in some way a way of getting out of the physical, right? And on the other hand, we go through life glossing over the beautiful physicality around us. When in reality, that paradox is the, the 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 I don't want to say the perfect spiritual life, but the the in our my estimation, the proper spiritual life is one that is so deeply aware and attentive to the world around us, whether it's the natural world around us, whether it's the people around us, that it deepens our connection to the divine. It deepens our connection to what we call the light of the creator. But because well, I think the there's other- a lot of judgment for people have this expectation if you're a spiritual person you want nothing to do with the physical world yeah and it's but the kabbalists wrong. speak about actually you're supposed to enjoy from all of the world including physicality it's not just to sit there and you know pray and just be spiritual all day because by the way that's an impossibility we're made up of, of different forces right but we're supposed to enjoy everything that life has to offer right and extract from our physical, there's a, like you said, this reason why, you know, there's, there's a, a famous quote from a great Kabbalist where he said, you know, we are not meant to be angels. God has an endless amount of angels in the heavens. We are meant to be man that Humans. is in, in, in the physical world and making that divine. Because if not, we wouldn't come into a human body. We would just stay exactly. a soul. And, and one of my favorite verses from Isaiah, it says, turn your gaze up to the heavens and see, or I would say experience, the force that created all these things. But I think all of us, it's funny, even as I was preparing for this podcast, I just looked outside our window, and we had, it, was, it, was a, it was a windy day, and the, 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 the branches of the tree, now we're in spring, they're all green, like we're just you know, sort of waving up and down, up and down. And I can't give you an explanation to what I extracted from that, but just to say that spending those one or two minutes just focusing on that just made me more feel more connected to the divine. Well, you know, it's funny this morning, you know, we sleep with our window open sometimes. And this morning, um, I woke up before my alarm and 
the temperature is just right. And um, this bird was just like singing so beautifully, like the same pattern over and over again. And I, I opened my eyes, I closed them, and I kind of just stayed still for a moment. And I was like, oh my God, this bird is saying good morning to me. I really felt like that. And then the the morning had a series of unexpected events happen that could have made me a little reactive. Instead, I was like, I just woke up to the most beautiful sound with the bird. Like that nature greeted me and helped me not be reactive to what followed very quickly after that in the early morning. Right. And I think related to that is the idea that everything, and I mean, of, of course, of a spiritual nature, but we're talking about on the, of a physical nature, has so much more to give us than we're extracting from it. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. As I was sitting by my desk in the story that I just told, and, and I noticed the branches moving. And it gave me inspiration, and it gave me connection. I just as well, and I'm sure I do this many times, right? It's the one time that I'm sharing that I saw and paid attention and really meditated on the movement of the trees. But there, I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands, if not thousands, of times when I and so, so many of our listeners on the movement, or you actually just you allowed it focused, to move you. Focus. I just fo- focus. Focus. So I'm seeing like even and again, not to get too romantic here. So I'm sitting here across from you at the table, Aww, and chefs. and. <laughs> Shucks, I'm not going to be too. No, but, no, you're gonna... but, but the point is, like you know, you can meditate upon your wife, husband, partner's face, right being, um, or or as many of us do, you just go through life and you sort of you know you you don't notice, right? And I think this is if we are to hopefully inspire our lis- our listeners today, it is uh, with three things we've already said. One. The beautiful paradox of this world is that, in order to be a spiritual being, you have to be deeply noticing and enmeshed in the beauty of not only the natural world around us, but the beauty of the people around us, just physical of course, right? The, the 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 them being around us and taking the time to really just focus on it, just focus on it. And second, the fact that I remember, and I, I might have shared this in a previous podcast. When I, I many years ago, I read a, 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 a meditation book uh, written by a, a Kabbalistic teacher, and he said that a true spiritual person said was able to look at a meditate on a rose, and every minute and do it for hours, right? Not necessarily recommending for, but extract just more and more again inspiration, connection, beauty from it. Also, in that process. Because there's so much more to it, right? Mm-hmm. There's so much more to it. So, yeah, the word meditate is maybe a confusing word, but but, but focus, focus, and and I think a big problem is that our world, especially the digital world, moves so fast, and there are so many distractions that we're losing our not only ability but but even constant awakening to 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 focus on people. What's to interesting? focus on the natural world, to focus on the beauty that, that that's around us. I've had times where I'm maybe reading or I'm sitting by the fire, even like if I have a treatment or something and my phone starts to vibrate and I'm in a state that's already relaxed, I notice right away that my body is having a reaction to it and then my mind's like, oh, we, I'm supposed to be doing something when I'm really, in fact, not. Um, and much of this article talks a lot about the distraction and that you know, whatever we thought to be um, what took us away from prayer before, whether it was temptation or whatever else, they're saying today it's actually distraction. As that keeps us from getting to this place where we stop and notice things. There's one of my most favorite books. It's something I read. Um, it's a short, short read. I read it probably three times a year. It's called A Short Guide to a Happy Life by Anna Quinlan. I like her for very, for different, many reasons. Um, I like her voice. She's very, similar to, I think, the way I kind of write. But also when she writes this book, I like her frankness and humor. She says she never earned a doctorate or even a master's degree. She isn't an expert in any particular field. And each time she gives a commencement speech, she feels like a fraud. (laughs) And she said, Yogi Berra's advice is as good as any. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Um, (laughs) But anyway, she goes, she's deeper than that too. But she wrote this and I wanted to read it um, because it really resonates with me. She says, so I suppose the best piece of advice I could give anyone is pretty simple. Get a life, a real life, not a manic pursuit of the next promotion, the bigger paycheck, the larger house. Do you think you'd care so very much about those things if you developed an aneurysm one afternoon or found a lump in your breast while in the shower? Get a life in which you notice, 
Get a life in which you notice the smell of salt water pushing itself on a breeze over the dunes. A life in which you stop and watch how a red-tailed hawk circles over a pond and a stand of pines. Get a life in which you pay attention to the baby as she scowls with concentration when she tries to pick up a Cheerio with her thumb and first <laughs> finger. That, <laughs> turn off your cell phone. Turn off your regular phone. So, that, For that matter, keep still. Be present. Right. It's just that, that vision. That, and those of us who have children, you know, just, like when, when, they, when they're, they're trying to pick up the Cheerio, and it's so difficult for them. But you know that they, there's literally no other thought in their mind right now than how do I pick up this Cheerio? And, and that's, by the way, it stops. It makes you stop and take notice. And then just one more part to end, end that part. She says, it's so easy to waste our lives, our days, our hours, our minutes. It's so easy to take for granted the pale new growth on an evergreen, the sheen of the limestone on Fifth Avenue, the color of our kids' eyes, the way the melody in a symphony rises and falls and disappears and rises again. It's so easy to exist instead of live. Unless you know there is a clock ticking. So many of us change our lives when we heard a biological clock and decided to have kids. But that sound is a murmur compared to the tolling of mortality. Beautiful. Beautiful. Just those details of s- smelling the sand or the salt, right? Right. And that's, and that's what we were saying. There's so much power, beauty, inspiration around us, but... That we're meant to, that's set up for us to pause. If not, you take this world and this life so seriously, right? That you forget, you know, it's like that, like one of my favorite lines in the well, movie. Well, if I can say, it's not so much you take this world, you take the next thing you need to do so seriously, right? As opposed to saying, and this is what I often try to think, I want to live inspired, I, I want to extract the maximum from this second, right? And how do you do that? By, by really, you know, we call it being present, but really... Having that consciousness, I like you know, like you said, I often if I see a bird flying, I'll stop. I do too, and I'll pay attention to it. The colors and and, and, and how how beautiful is that, and how inspiring is that? But we don't do that. We don't do it enough. We don't do it enough. And I think when we don't, then we tend to take ourselves too seriously. What I was saying is that one of my favorite lines from the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, he said, um, "Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you're going to miss it." Exactly. And we're missing that. And that's, I've shared this story, but I think it's just, for me, it's just such an pa- impactful story. It's worth repeating. Miriam, our oldest daughter, who's now almost 20, was, we were living in LA at the time. So she was five, six, maybe seven in that range. That was her stage where she would like skip around everywhere yeah. and like hop and sing. Yeah. Yeah. And I was walking, we lived in LA. We lived about five minutes from, from, uh, the Kabbalah Center in Los Angeles, and we were, I was walking with her. It was a Friday afternoon, and as I was walking, my head was filled with many important ideas, topics, questions, concerns, and so for the first two or three blocks, you know, I'm holding her hand, and she's, I'm not even paying attention to what she's doing, but like you said, she was singing, she was, she was skipping, and I was in my mind, and I, I, I thought, right, if you ask me, what are you doing right now? Well, I'm thinking about really important things, yeah. right? <laughs> Got to solve all the problems in yeah, the world. Yeah, or people, you know, I'm sure, it, you know, these were, these were important ideas and thoughts. But then two or three w- blocks into the walk, I stop and pay attention, right, to Miriam. And she's singing, and she's, and, and it's so beautiful, right? Any one of us with parents who know those moments that you sort of stop yourself and just noticing, no taking in what's well, what you remember the, all these years later exactly <laughs> I, I have no idea what i was thinking of all those right. important <laughs> thoughts and that's don't let life go by you know there's a another teaching which i find also very inspiring and and i try to direct my life according to this that you know there's a person who can live you know, there's a concept that's called the length of days. So it's not just a l- many days or, or, or many years of life, but the blessing is you should have length of days. And the Kabbalist asks, what does it mean, length of days? Because there's a person who can live a hundred years in one day, which means the day is full. He or she extracts of the beauty, notices, takes in, meditates upon the beauty, the natural beauty, the people in their lives, the love in their lives, their friendships in their lives. Each day. Every day, and then it's a full day. It's a long day. That's, and then there are people who can go live, you know, eighty years, and they're just going one thing to the next to the next. Those are very shallow days, 
even if you accomplished a lot, even if you did, a, you went to many places and you did many things, but there's so much more to extract. So much more to extract. And I was going to say one of my, uh, I have many favorite quote, quotes around this topic because I, I think I think it's so fundamental to a not just a spiritual life, but but a happy life, a real full life. And Mary Oliver says, attention is the beginning of devotion. Mm-hmm. That if you want to be devoted to your wife, you want to be devoted to your children, you want to be devoted to your life, attention. Ask yourself, I would say to every single one of our listeners, how many moments of attention did you have today? Which means you probably need to move, remove distraction, right? Yes. Because it takes up most of our time and space. It's not only about paying attention, it's also looking at what you currently are paying attention Absolutely. to. Absolutely. If I can, I'd like to quote Andrew Sullivan. He wrote, Just as the modern street lighting has slowly blotted the stars from the visible skies, so too have cars and planes and factories and flickering digital screens combined to rob us of a silence that was previously regarded as integral to the health of the human imagination. This changes us. It slowly removes, without our even noticing it, the very spaces where we can gain a footing in our minds and souls that is not captive to constant pressures or desires or duties. I mean, I'm very aware of that. And when I think about it, I'm like, oh my God, we live in New York City, but that's why we make such a conscious effort to go hiking, to go to Connecticut, to go just to get into or anything Or to sit across nature, the table from each other and really notice Or put a fireplace on. No, but we always put an element of nature into it, right? When we want to connect, there's there's always something that that has that, even fire, right? Um, and, and I mean, I'm better about this, I think. It annoys me when you look at I'm your sure. phone. Uh, right now? When we're dating. <laughs> <laughs> when we're currently dating. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, that's part of it, right? I mean, even if you live in a place that's not that inspiring, there's always ways to bring that nature yeah, in. Yeah, and I, and I want to, right, it's not just the natural world, it's, it's the people. It's even sitting down and that's why we try to start off our day in 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 appreciation i mean it's kind of crazy right i mean the, you know as we say but you know those of us who have health those of us who have family like just take five minutes and just just meditate on that and you know notice that well it's funny as you say that because um andrew sullivan said he wrote i there's an article also in new york magazine i used to be a human being just like the <laughs> title of that that every minute I was engrossed in a virtual interaction, I was not involved in a human encounter. Every second absorbed in some trivia was a second less for any form of reflection or calm or spirituality. Right? And I think like, and if I look at my days, right, days that I feel really lit up and happy, like today, today, there's a third pad. Was it because I wasn't here? <laughs> yeah, I out of town. This is the third podcast I did. Um, I squeezed in three other calls with people who had wanted, who needed counsel. And I felt I felt very connected on a human level to people today. All of them was in Texas, another one was in Arizona, Los Angeles, uh, somebody in in Moscow. This is all in one day, right? So I feel like I've been all over the world and I feel very tapped into the world because of that, right? Of course, there's an aspect of sharing too that that excites me, but you can feel different when you're just like behind a screen or looking at your phone or get engaged with the wrong things, people that have now taken your day, right? Taken your energy in that day. Um, and I think that for some, you know, we have big things happen to us that kind of like shake us out of that reality and we wake up and we realize that we need to be attuned to the universe. And that means being attuned daily and not just in some prayer or or in a moment that you hear something inspiring, but really living with that consciousness. And I just want to quote Anna Quindlen again, because she lost her mother, um, when she was in college. And I often speak about how we all have before and after moments because we're forever changed. And we're especially changed by the hard things that happen to us in life. Most people think they're not changed. I got, I got through that. I'm so happy that's over with. It was really the most painful part of my life, but I'm over with it. But I don't think people stop to ponder, well, who have you become because of it? You've, you are changed. You either become a better version of yourself or maybe a worse version of yourself. Maybe now you're closed or you're emotionally stunted. Maybe you're not, maybe your heart opened up, right? And so I've really, I've thought about that a lot in the last couple of years, especially, and I really share this with many people when I'm especially a guest on, on different podcasts or whatever, that there's that before and after. And she also touches upon that. Did you want to say something before I read Yeah, uh, one of my most important teachings from Rav Ashlag, he says, 
that when anything significant happens in our lives, there's only two things that can happen. It's binary. Either we grow and become better, or we become worse. You, you do not, cannot, it's, just, it's a spiritual law, that when a significant occurrence, something happens in our lives that is big, there is no possibility of remaining the same person. What's it's binary. I shared this when I was on Maria Menounes's podcast, and uh, she was like, oh my God, she's like, I have a picture of my before and after. I was like, what do you mean? And she was um, on a TV show, and it was her last day, and she was actually really excited that it was last. She loved the show, but she was moving on to something else that she was excited about. And she, I think she was wearing like a yellow fitted suit, and she's like, I remember, I was so happy. And I looked at that picture, I was like, oh my God, it's like the best day. And then the next day she found out that her mom um, was had cancer um, and she was going to die. And she often looked back at that picture and she's like, I'm just not that person anymore because she was so changed by what happened, right? Interesting. Um, so this is from uh, Anna Quindlin's book. She said, it's amazing how much you can learn in one year. I have found that one horrible year has given me a perspective on all those things I wouldn't otherwise have had. Before and after for me was not just before my mother's illness and after her death. It was the dividing line between seeing the world in black and white and in technicolor. The lights came on for the darkest possible reason. And I went back to school and I looked around at all the kids I knew who found kind of life to be a drag and who weren't sure if they could really hack it and who thought life was a bummer. And I knew that I had undergone a sea change because I was never going because I was never again going to be able to see life as anything except a great gift. Beautiful. Mm. And I was thinking about that, as you were saying, a lot of people think about life, you know, today was an okay day, whatever, I just got through it, but you know, next week I'm going on vacation. Or like, I or, had to suffer through this day because it's going to get me closer to my goal, or you know, we just write the days off. And the point is, again, just back to what we said before, there's so much to extract from everything, every moment. One of my favorite both concepts and words in the ancient spiritual teachings is the idea that what people refer to as God, what universe, whatever words people use, the beautiful word that I think I find it so inspiring that, that the Kabbalists use is the endless. So the force that created everything is the endless, the force that exists within everything is the endless. And what that means is that everything is attached to the endless this cup that I'm drinking from is connected to the endless, which means there's a way, if I'm able to, you know, see the beauty of this cup, meditate on this cup, that I can actually connect to the endless, to endless to light. unpack what endless is. Ex Limitless. Exactly. Go, Energy, you, light, we think, is back to the souls. Well, no, I, I, let, me, let, me, let me make it simple. So I'll use the example that I was saying before. I'm watching the tree branches go up and down, up and down. I have two, I had two choices, to ignore that and extract zero inspiration, joy, connection from the, tree, the wind and the tree interaction, or I can start extracting from it energy, inspiration, excitement, whatever those things that, that happen to us when we notice things. And the beauty of that is that not only are we extracting such limited amount of pleasure from everything around us, the knowledge that there is actually endless pleasure, light, inspiration, connection, in everything around us. You know, it's not finite. We think it's finite, right? I think most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, even when we're sitting with our children, or with our wife, or with our friend, we think, well, you know, how much can I extract from this relationship? Well, it's fine. I, maybe it's a lot more than I'm experiencing now, but it's still, you know, it has a limit. No. Nothing is limited, because everything is connected to what we call that endless light, that endless, endless energy of the Creator, the creative force of this world. And so this is past yeah. death. This is, I'm trying to put it in a way people... Oh, that, I didn't talk about that. Yeah. No, <laughs> people understand, like, the endless, you're saying that an experience of your child is finite. I'm not sure that I would agree with that. But I think if you ask somebody, uh, we'll ask our listeners, how much pleasure did you get from your children today? They'll tell you. You know, if you had to give a scale of one to ten, well, it depends if they like their children. <laughs> okay, assuming they like their children, a scale of one to ten, I had 
Yeah, I, got, I was at a five because I was distracted. I was busy, but I did spend that time. And then if I ask the next question, what's the maximum amount of pleasure you can express right. from your kids? I understand. It's kind of like a it relationship. Would, it, your your love is meant to grow and each day, each year, and people don't actually understand their tap into that. So the amount that they get from the relationship might be five, 10%. They love each other, but their experience of the relationship isn't the totality of what it could be, which would be tapped into the end. And how exciting is it to know that in our relationship, there is no limit to how much pleasure we can extract. Right. And that's the point. It's not limited. I think most of us think, because we experience, we, we allow ourselves to, to experience, you know, limited pleasure. Limited. In, Based in, on what we experience, we think that that is all that is to experience. Or there's a little bit more, or even a lot more that I can, but limitless? Mm-hmm. The fact that, that love can grow limitless? The fact that my pleasure from a tree can grow limitless because it's all connected to the endless. I think that I, I find that so inspiring. And again, even and for our listeners, just that directive in mind, right? That thought that why is it so important to notice? Why is it so important to meditate? And meditate, I don't mean in, in sort of the you know uh, the way most people, but just paying attention to the beauty, to the natural world around us, to the people around well, us. Well, like conscious thought, right? Yeah. Meditation, really. Yeah, because this again. We're living such a limited life. We are extracting so so little from what we have, and then we say, "Oh well, I I need. Why do I need the next thing? Why I need the next thing? Because what's what all those things that I have? I'm only getting this much from. I need the next thing. But 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 the the thought, the understanding that from what I have, I'm only extracting a tiny percentage. Let me pay attention to the tree outside. Let me pay attention to the to the beautiful bird flying. Let me pay attention to my child even more. Let me meditate upon the love that, that I have with my spouse. And you'll see that you're able to extract so much more. That's so funny. Much more. Then later today in the afternoon, running around, I between things made a cup of tea and then I heard that bird singing to me again. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this you is great. Friend. I know. And I really wanted to make eye contact with it, but I didn't have time to go look for it. I should have actually actually taken the time because I wanted to see this bird that made me so happy today. <laughs> you know? So um, I asked myself a question, where do I pray with my eyes open? Because I do have obviously conscious prayer in the morning, like very specific intentional prayer. And what came to me is, and I've always known this when I exercise, it's when I feel I'm in um, praying with my eyes open because I, I'm fully feeling grounded and grateful and um, inspired and creative and happy. It's all of those things in one. Um, when I look into my children's eyes, absolutely. Uh, that's prayer or connecting for me. And also then I was thinking that the irony is when we really savor something, right? We find something that we enjoy, we taste, touch, in whatever of our five senses, we usually close our eyes, right? But then when we close our eyes intentionally to connect, it's not, it's harder, right? So it's it's interesting that, again, to that physicality, we're meant to take from all of our senses, all of our experiences, and internalize that. And through that, actually, it forces you to do the thing you're forcing yourself to do when you think you should pray. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Um, I do want to share one last thing from Anna Quindlin. I, I always loved this as well. Um, she said, I found one of my best teachers on a boardwalk at Coney Island many years ago. It was December, and I was doing a short story about homeless suffer, how homeless suffer in the winter months. He and I sat on the edge of the wooden supports, dangling our feet over the side, and he told me about his schedule, panhandling the boulevard when the summer crowds were gone, sleeping in a church when the temperature went below freezing, hiding from the police amid the tilt a world and the cyclone and a cyclone at some of the other seasonal rides. But he told me that most of the time he stayed on the boardwalk facing the water just the way we're sitting now, even when it got cold and he had to wear his newspapers after he read them. And I asked him why. Why didn't he go to one of the shelters? Why didn't he check himself into the hospital for detox? And he stared at the ocean and said, look at the view, young lady. Look at the view. And every day, in some little way, I try to do what he said. I try to look at the view. That's all. Words of wisdom from a man with not a dime in his pocket, not a place to go, nowhere to be. Look at the view. When I do what he said, I'm never disappointed. That's beautiful. Mm. That's beautiful. 
Um, and I'd like to leave our listeners with a quote from... I like that I made you cry twice today. <laughs> How did you know I was crying? I, 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 know, <laughs> I know you. You know what it was? Actually, I made a conscious effort to listen to your voice, right? Even though I hear your voice all the time. And I think... And Sometimes, this... yeah. Ha-ha. <laughs> 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 um, this is... Uh... We did it at the same time. Ready? One, two, three. Ha-ha. <laughs> This is from a uh, Mary Oliver uh, poem, which I, I find very beautiful and um, inspiring. I love this one. Is this when death comes? Yes, <laughs> when death comes. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I just love that line. Mm-hmm. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Beautiful. See, we are talking about death and life. <laughs> right. But for me, the, 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 that line, right? I, w- I was the bride, sorry, I, w- I was the bride married to amazement. And that's only through goals. That's what we want. Yes. By noticing and really paying attention and stopping. And paying attention. So put away your phones. <laughs> well, now well, the they're, television. They've been listening to the podcast. So no, now, after. Oh right. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to share an email from one of our listeners, Sarah from the UK, from Brighton. Uh, she says, "Hello, beautiful souls. My <clears throat> name is Sarah, and I'm writing from Brighton, UK. With this email, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being who you are: brave, positive, strong, curious, open, passionate." full of joie de vivre, Ooh, desire, joie de vivre. and light, and many, many more. In fact, infinite beautiful things. I thank the light that shines within you. Your podcast, Spiritually Hungry, is now a part of my spiritual routine and helping me a lot in many different ways. It allows me to understand how life works. And now that I know a bit better the rules, I want to know more and be part of the game with consciousness. Beautiful. Beautiful, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that with us and through us, to all of our listeners. And this is the time to remind all of our listeners to share this podcast with everybody you know. I believe that it will inspire them and hopefully make their lives just a little bit better, if not a lot more better. But that's not pro- pro- proper grammar, but that's fine. No, it's not. <laughs> and go to Apple Podcasts, write five star reviews, share with Monica and I all of your questions, stories, inspirations. And as Sarah did, anything that this podcast again inspires and brings light into your life, send your questions, comments, stories, jokes, maybe, to Monica and Michael at Joke. why not? Spiritually hungry dot life. Monica and Michael at spiritually hungry dot life. If there are topics you want us to cover, uh, uh, any other ideas or inspiration, please. We, as I always remind. Uh, all of our listeners, we are inspired by your letters that you share with us. And I, I am sure that as we read them to our listeners, it inspires them as well. So you have really the gift, the ability to give inspiration and light to hundreds of thousands of people who are listening to this podcast. So don't forget to send us everything that you have to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. Stay spiritually hungry. <laughs>